Welcome to the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast on the WITRN Network. Come join us as we study the Word of God together. Go get your Bible and let's see what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. We've been having our discussion on salvation, soteriology, the study of salvation. We've, we've done with the forgiveness, and we're still under the umbrella of salvation. And today, the, the next leg of salvation we're going to talk about, and they all overlap, is redemption. Redemption. So when I say uh, redeem, uh, just off the top of your head, uh, Steve, what do you think about redeem? Another chance. Another chance, all right. What about you, Stacey? Um, redeem means to buy back. Buy back. Uh, Venus, redeem? Same type of mentality. Okay. Uh, Freddie, anything different from this morning? What would you say about redeem? Um, no, nothing different from this morning. Okay. Only thing different could be cashing in. Cashing in, okay. All right. Uh, free to read the theological definition of re redeem. Number read number eight and number nine. Okay. Nine would be the theological one. Read number eight too. Number eight. This is out of dictionary.com. Number eight. To obtain to obtain the release or restoration of as from captivity by paying a ransom and to deliver from sin and its consequences by means of a sacrifice offered for the sinner. Okay, by that definition, we see some words. We see the sacrifice. We see sin. We see uh, kind of avoiding the punishment. We talked about Adam and Eve last week, and we came to the conclusion because God is not governed by time, and time is a creation by God, that when he gave the 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 uh, the prophecy in, in, in the garden, the minute he gave that prophecy, it came into existence. He did forgive them. It's just that it wasn't realized by them, it was realized in their posterity. A lot of times what we see in the Old Testament, God would say something in that period of time, but it, but it was really for another period of time. And just like normal humans, we think if God said now, he means now for us. But since he sees us outside of time, then what he says, he always is in the now. He's always going to speak in the now. Uh, for us, it may be future. For us, it may be past. But God is always in the present. It's because he's omnipresent. He's always here. He's always around. He's always existed. So the redemption of man, the buyback of man, assumes a lot of things. So if I'm going, if he's going to redeem us, what can we assume about us as far as human beings, as, as, as needing redemption? What can we assume? We're sinful. We're sinful. What else? We're slaves to sin. We're slaves to sin. What else? Guilty. Guilty. Good. Uh, afraid of anything else? What do you think about it? What does it say about us if we need redeeming? Somebody get that. Um, that we've fallen away. <laughs> Fall away from what? We're not right with God. Okay, we're not right with God, okay? All right. So if we fall away, we're not right with God, we are sinful. So so is would it be a good statement and you can correct me if I'm wrong by what we just said that that all sinners need redemption. Is that a fair statement? Yes, yes. I say so. Okay. So if all sinners need redemption, then our next question would have to be um how do we get redeemed? How do we get redeemed? If we need it, how do we get it? Anybody? Through the blood of Christ. Through the blood of Christ. Atonement. Through the atonement. So we got the A word up there, the atonement. Okay, so that's how we receive it. So let's go to scripture. And our scripture for today is it's up on the board, all of them. Most of them, not all of them. Ephesians chapter 1. 
and Frida's gonna read from one until seven. We're gonna concentrate on seven. We're gonna see what it says. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop. Okay, I asked in day class this. Okay, we know this, this is written to the church, so this is written to save folk, all right? The faithful in the church of Ephesus. I asked them this, what is an apostle? Uh, let's start over here. What's an apostle? Um, like, a, like a messenger, somebody who should, uh, like a messenger, somebody sent by God. Okay, so I'm just going to play with you for a minute. <laughs> Is an angel and an apostle the same thing? Because angels are messengers. Um, I'm going to say no. No? Okay. All right. I ain't going to ask you why. <laughs> All right. Stacy, apostle. What is an apostle? Um, an apostle is someone who actually seen Jesus. Seen Jesus. And, and seen Jesus how? Seen and walked with him. Okay. All right. That's an apostle. Somebody who walked with Jesus. Did, did Paul walk with Jesus? No, he didn't, but he got the revelation okay. from Jesus. So it's not cut and dry that it's someone who walks with Jesus, right? Right. All right. That's good, though. That you, that's the normal answer. Steve, what's an apostle? One who is sent. One who is sent. You, you generally have it. Oh, never mind. <laughs> it's up on the board. Never mind. I ain't going to keep I, going I, now. I, I, that's I, good. He cheated. <laughs> the, uh, apostle is simply, simply one who is sent. Okay. Now, I know you, you we're talking in the realm of church, but if you think about it, apostle is one who is sent with by higher authority, okay, that has the, the authorization. And so when we read on Sunday, we talked about us being ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Every ambassador is, is an apostle of the church, mm -hmm. okay? You were sent by the church. You were sent by the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ. Now... There's no more capital A apostles like they had during the time of Paul in the first century church because those apostles came with sign gifts to validate. Why did they come with sign gifts, Venus? You said why did they come with sign gifts? Uh-huh, why did the apostles come with sign gifts? To, to, so that to validate that this is from the word of God. To validate their sin from God, amen. So, so they came with, their, their validation was in the sign gifts. That, there's, that they were sent from God, okay? Those signs, wonders, and miracles that were done by them, uh, that validated their message, all right? So it wasn't, the, it wasn't the miracles that was important, but it just gave credence to who they were because during that time, that's what people were looking for. You validated your message of being from God by miracles. We see that in the Old Testament, okay? Not all prophets did miracles, but we see that when major dispensations or major kairos moments, which means epic times in the dispensation that God is, is dealing with man in time, he would do a miracle, okay? One of the miracles that, 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 that we talk about that he tries to, he reminds them all the time, what is the one miracle that uh, God reminds the children of Israel about all the time when they get in trouble? Stacy. Crossing the Red Sea. Crossing the Red Sea, Steve. Not say nothing. Don't leave the air. Don't leave the air open. Um, <laughs> we broadcasted. Maybe Elijah calling down the fire. Elijah calling down the fire. Uh, leaving Egypt. Leaving Egypt. Yeah. Ain't that right, Venus? Yeah. She's an Old Testament yeah. teacher. Yeah. So, so every time that they would do something, he would always remind them about what. When I brought you out of Egypt, yep. mm -hmm. okay? When he delivered them from Egypt, when he redeemed them from Egypt. Is there a difference between uh, uh, redemption and deliverance? I think it is. Okay. Because in order to be redeemed, some, it, it, you have to have um, a different kind of deliverance. Like Jesus mm -hmm. died for our redemption, so he had to die for our blood. Okay. Sacrifice to redeem us. Delivering means that I just removed you from a circumstance and nobody had to die. Some people could die, but nobody had to die as a sacrifice. Did, do y'all agree with that or can y'all? 
a uh, little pushback or do y'all got something else to say? Because in the because it since we've been redeemed, we're gonna find that we have been delivered from from one place to another. Well, our redemption took us out of darkness and placed us into where? Light. Into light. And also we part of our redemption is del we're delivered into what? It, it, well, yeah, eternal life. That's one of them. That's, but you yeah. said something else. From death. No, before that. Eternity. You said it. Eternity. Is what you, said. Okay, were we, who we baptized into? Jesus. Into Jesus. So we're delivered into the baptism of Jesus. You know, and again, we're discussing this. It's not right or wrong. I just want to see what's on your mind. All right? But, but Go ahead. But the difference is the Israelites were never redeemed. They were just delivered because they kept going back. Yeah, we yeah, we yeah, that's true. And that's that's true. the reason I'm not arguing. I'm just saying that that was the basis of what I was saying was that the difference between us and the Israelites is their deliverance was a physical thing, but in uh, but the spiritual thing they never. I don't. I don't. I believe they never understood the deliverance in that way. Okay. All right. I All right. Think Go ahead. It, it, remember whenever we were talking about forgiveness and mercy mm -hmm. and how they're similar and you can't have one without the other, but mm -hmm. you can have one separate from the other? Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of like that. Delivers the same way? Yeah, okay. possibly. You can have together, you can have together and possibly separate. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's fine. You remember what I'm saying. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. When we're we, we trying to debate about forgiveness and mercy. Do you need to forgive somebody to give them mercy? And we say, no, you don't, because you can do a kind act of mercy. And it has nothing to do because that person hasn't wronged you. Yeah. So Venus is right. That's that's a good way to look at it. All of you guys are right. It's not a wrong thing, okay? I just the way you look at things. All right, Frida, go ahead, continue to read. We got what the apostle is out the way. We got who this is written to. Let's see what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So we now we have this word called predestination. For those of us who are saved, you know, that's kind of a scary word out here in the theology realm. They argued, they debated back and forth. And basically, he's telling us that for those of us he, that will be saved, we've been predestined to be in Christ Jesus. And our other predestination is to be with Christ Jesus. If you're not saved, where are you predestined to? To hell. To hell. There's only two places to go. So you either have the predestination into Christ Jesus, into the, the uh, uh, eternal life with him, or you were predestined because you didn't accept Christ Jesus, you get, didn't get delivered, you didn't get redeemed, and you and you in a different position. And we see that all this is is uh, attributed to the fact that he what loves us. Everything is out of love for God, okay? So, and we look at love as the overarching uh, 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 reason for that forgiveness can happen because we understand how much we've been loved. So we have this act of love of placing us in Christ Jesus through the redemption and all that. Go ahead. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Okay, go ahead. Making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to, un to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So we, we have redemption through what? It's right there in front of you. Through his blood. Through his blood. So we know that, that, that this redemption is his blood. So if we're talking about the word redeem, as far as what the blood is, what would you consider the blood based upon our definitions that we had? What is the blood? The atonement. The atonement. What is the blood? I'm, look, I'm looking for simple stuff. I mean, that's right, but I'm looking for simple stuff. What, what is the blood? What is the blood? The if payment. It's the payment. The blood is the currency, right? Mm. <laughs> the blood is the currency by which we are redeemed, that God accepts. It's just like if, if you took... Uh, 
uh, at Costco, and I heard that they don't do nothing but accept Visa. Now, you may have a MasterCard, but you go through the MasterCard, they're not going to accept it. But if you got a Visa, they'll take it. Well, the same thing with God. God can only accept one blood to redeem us all, which is the blood of Jesus Christ, which he gave up willingly. So we see that the currency for redemption is the blood of Christ. All right? All right. Let's look at uh, Galatians. 2 and 20. Just read uh, 2 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Mm -hmm. So we now we have, again, in the redemption, you have the giving of his life in exchange. Okay. Now we see it's by the blood, and we see that it's exchanged. His life for our life. Why was in, why did, what do we have from him that he gave us by giving up his life? Eternal life. You have eternal life? What else? Okay, let me ask you this another way. What gives us the right to have eternal life? What he did on the cross. Okay. And because we have something else I'm looking for. What else did we receive from Jesus uh, in, uh, at the cross? Righteousness. Righteousness. And what kind of righteousness is it? Imputed. Imputed righteousness. What does imputed righteousness mean, Nancy? That it was given, it was given to us, and we didn't deserve, like we didn't do anything for it. It's just given to us. So we earned. So we, so we didn't did earn it. Earn. We oh. did not earn it. Okay. <laughs> so it's imputed. And what was imputed to him, Venus? Our sin. Our sin. So it was a switch. Mm -hmm. He got our sin. We got his righteousness. Paid for by what? His blood. His blood. All right. Go to uh, uh, Colossians 114 through 22. Colossians 114 through 22. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Back up. Go, go higher than 114. Go maybe... 13 to 12. Uh -huh. Matter of fact, let Nancy read that. 12 through 22. Okay. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. So, stop. So, now we see a, a benefit from being uh, redeemed. We have, what, what did it say right there? We have a what? A benefit. A benefit. What is the benefit? The inheritance. The inheritance. Mm -hmm. In what? In light? We have inheritance in light, okay? So part of the benefit of being redeemed, we got an inheritance. Let me ask you this. What do you think the inheritance is that we have being redeemed? What is our inheritance? It's thrown around a lot. I heard that word out there in the Christian circles. We got an inheritance coming. What is that? What is that? What do we inherit? Eternal life. Eternal life. Anything else? I know we have heard in here forgiveness. Okay. Anything else? So again, this is this is this is I wanted to get this is why I want you guys to think about it because when somebody say somebody say, Oh, so what do we inherit? And you'd right. be stuck. Right. Like, you know, it's it's like these are the things we need to think about. Mm -hmm. What do we inherit? We oh, said yes. forgiveness, mm -hmm. hope, yes. eternal life, righteousness. uh righteousness, uh uh yes. eventually a glorified body. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of things that we are part of the redemption is our inheritance and an inheritance by definition uh, assumes that we have a right to it mm -hmm. based upon what he did for us. Okay, go ahead for you. I mean, go ahead, Nancy, to 22. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved so there we go. Nancy said it. We've been delivered from the domain of darkness to his kingdom of his beloved son. When were we in darkness? I don't remember that day. What happened? Oh, okay. Okay, I don't remember that day. I know I've been bad, but I didn't know that I didn't I was in darkness. What is the really that metaphor darkness? You wouldn't you know we see sun and everything. So what does that actually mean? That we was in darkness. We were in sin. 
We born it, but what was what what did the sin cause? Why do we just why does God describe it as being a dark moment or darkness? Because our hearts are deceitfully wicked and evil. Okay. That's the life we were living. We're All right. Living a dark life. Well, what does that mean? And we're separated. We separated from. God. There you go. Yeah. We separated from God. Yeah. So God describes darkness as being separated from Him, mm -hmm. and He calls being reattached to Him. The light, right? So light is God, and being that we that that we're separated, what what are we separated from that we've learned in the Old Testament? What are we separate? How are we separated? What are we separated from actually having with God? A relationship. A relationship. What kind? Let me ask you this: In the Old Testament, who do they need to communicate to God for, Venus? A prophet or a priest. A prophet or a priest. So there was an intermediary between mm -hmm. us and, and God the Father. Right. Now, we can have the intimate now we can have a direct line to God. You don't need a you don't really need a pastor. You don't need you don't need an apostle. You don't need none of these people to have a relationship with God as a saint. Right. Now, some people say, well, well, what's your purpose? To tell you that you don't need a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and to work myself so that you can stand on your own. And the only reason I'm your pastor is to teach you. That's it. The only reason Vince's job is to teach you guys, you know, and let you live out your life under Christ. And you come to church to fellowship and enjoy the fellowship of the saints. We brothers and sisters. So the church should be a, a, a enjoying thing and not a laborious uh, 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 time. You shouldn't feel upset coming to church. You know, stay home. If, that's, if it bothers you to come, stay home. And it's okay. L listen on the phone if that's what you want to do. But... Again, we've been redeemed from dark to light, the separation, no communication. And what God did, God provided a way, but it's different than the way of the Israelites. That's why I always talk about dispensation is important. A lot of times what saints do, Sister Nancy, is they keep using Old Testament rituals, Old Testament ways. And God say, I'm doing a new thing. We got a new relationship with God. We don't have to have a priest. We don't have to have a blood sacrifice. We don't have to go to the temple. We don't have to go to Israel every three, four times a year. Okay, that that dispensation is over. Now we know that Ezekiel is going to return, but right now we're in a church age, the dispensation of grace. So that which they used to do physically, we have we have in Christ Jesus because we know that He is our final sacrifice. Because we already established He brought us back. He did something bulls and goats and their blood could not do. He's the once and all sacrifice for mankind. Now, my next, before we go any further, what's, what was the problem with that, uh, Venus, with the Jews compared to uh, once we get to the Gospels? What was the problem with, as when Jesus got on the scene, you got the sacrificial system, what was the problem with the sacrificial system of that day? It was tainted. It was tainted. It was tainted. How, how was it tainted? Because they weren't pure. They were, doing, they were doing too much inter-religious type of things in the sanctuary. They, they intermingled with the races, which they was explicitly told what? Not, not to, to do. do. Okay? And one thing we know Jesus did, Jesus fulfilled all of the law. The ceremonial law. And we understand that the law and the ceremonies were a shadow. We're not talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about all the ceremonial laws. Okay? Go ahead, Nancy, read. So we delivered from the darkness into this, the kingdom of God, which is the light. Go ahead. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So we, we now we got another adjective into an a active verb into what his blood does. What does his blood do? Give us what? You ready? Peace. It gave us peace. Why do we need peace? Why do we need peace? We was already in darkness. Why do we need peace? We had enmity with God. 
We had enmity with God. What does enmity mean? We were enemies. We were enemies. We had constantly, regardless of what you think, you, you constantly was a lawbreaker. Mm -hmm. You was a blasphemer. You was a violator of the Ten Commandments. Okay? We were enemies of God by nature. All right? By nature. So we needed this redemption. And this redemption brought us back. This redemption gave us peace with God. So in the blood, we have, we, have the, we have the buying, we have the peace. Let me ask you this. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus, what's another benefit that we have? Since we have peace with God, since we've been redeemed by God, we've been forgiven by God, so then can anybody lay charge against us? No, they already paid. Because he's already paid it. So let me ask you something that's always debated. If we go back and do something that's wrong and wrong, that violates the Ten Commandments, are we still saved? Yes. yes. Why? Because we're redeemed by his blood. Right. But a lot of people would say probably no. Because what you assume is that your salvation is based upon, yeah. if you say that, your works. Right. Yeah. Your salvation is not based upon your works at all. Now, a saved person, believe it or not, can do something very heinous. And they're still saved. And I know we don't like to hear that. But the, it's a different. They taking it. You can you can still be saved and be redeemed, but that doesn't mean you're not going to be judged. You mean by like your actions? The, not by, not the, by, when you say judge, what do you mean? I, I, even though you're redeemed and you're forgiven by Christ, you there all you still um, there are always consequences to your actions. Okay. So, not by, I'm not talking about being judged by man, which you will be. But God still makes sure that you are accountable. Okay. So, so we, we discussed that last week. We, we understand accountability, but when you say that you're judged, you, you talk about the, the consequences of your actions, right? That there's going to be some kind of penalty. But forgiveness says, the Bible says he's forgiven us. And that there is no consequences to our actions. So we're talking about the consequences in time, or we're talking about judgment. When you say we're going to be judged, so what is the saint going to be judged, and what going to be the punishment of saints' judgment? What is the punishment of saints' judgment? It's in the scriptures. What is the punishment? Okay, the Bible says there's no more condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus, right? Right. So if we can't be condemned, then we know that punishment's off the table, right? Mm -hmm. So what punishment do we get? If we're going to be judged, we are, Venus is right. We are we are going to be judged. But what are we judged for? Okay, but what are, what are the consequences? What is his measurement of judgment here? When we get to God, the Bible talks about us being judged. Okay, which judgment are we going to participate in? The white throne. We're going to participate in the white throne judgment? Or are sinners going to participate in the white throne judgment? The sinners are going to participate in white throne judgment. Okay. So when we're judged, what are we being judged for? Our works. Okay. And what are the consequences of our works, good Crown. or bad? Crowns. So we're going to get rewarded right. for our works for God, right? And all that is not God is going to get burnt away. Right. Right. But we're not going to stand before God being judged to condemnation. Right. Right. So even though we might experience natural consequences on the earth realm, that, that judgment that makes the, that, that basically where the buck stops is with God. And he says, there's no more condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. And again, <coughs> there are plenty of guys in the penitentiary. There's pretty guys on death row, giving their life to Christ, have done some heinous crimes. The, the, the law of the land, which God has ordained for the terrors of the land to pass judgment in the way to satisfy the the, the law on earth, we got that. But the final law, even the the worst sinner that we can think of, the Jeffrey Dahmers, the Hitlers, we just don't know. Maybe Jeffrey, they say Jeffrey Dahmer gave his life to Christ. I don't know. But if Christ can't save him, if we if we got a caveat in our minds that Christ can't forgive him, then we got to check ourselves because what we've done is we've, we've transferred ourselves back into a darkness state of mind because now his blood can't affect Jeffrey Dahmer because I think it's so heinous. Oh, you know, I think it's so heinous and it is, mm -hmm. but I have to leave room for that man to have get free. Mm -hmm. 
The key with us saints is we always, the Bible says we learn Sunday, and no, you notice, we don't look at people after the flesh. No longer. Because he didn't look at us after the flesh. We look at them at, as, a spirit, as a soul that needs to be saved. And who needs to be saved more than somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer? If he can't be saved, can't none of us be saved? You know, again, do we like it in discussion? No. Anybody I'm not saying lie and tell you I like it. But I can tell you this. I understand that even the worst of the worst that I would think is the worst can be saved. Because if we really think about it, biblical history, Paul was probably one of the worst ones. Even Je what Jesus say? You persecute the church. You persecute me, my body. And Paul had to deal with the natural consequences of that in his assignment because Paul went from a persecutor to uh, a persecutor himself, persecutor, prosecutor himself to persecute Christians, to being persecuted for Christ. Okay? So Christ, sometimes he chooses, the Bible says he chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. When Paul first got introduced to the 12, they didn't want to see him because they were scared of him. Because of what they what he did to Stephen. All right? Which was so, a logical response. Which was a logical human response. Because again, you have to remember, they walked with Jesus and handled him in the flesh. Their full understanding of what was going on didn't come till later. Much later, actually. Okay? To whereas the Gentiles were included in this new thing called the way, which was what we call Christianity today. All right. Go to Psalms. Go to Psalms 111. Uh, free to start at verse one. No, Stacy, go to 111. You start at verse one and go to down to nine. <clears throat> Psalms 111. Mm-hmm. And go down to nine. Okay. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and those who practice it a good understanding. Okay, so we see that so, so we see that there was a redemption back in the time of Israel. Now we're going backwards, okay? So this is not the church age. Okay. Right. Again, he makes mention of this deliverance. Uh -huh. So again, when he's mentioning this, what is he referring to? <laughs> okay, yeah, we, we talk about we're in the nation of Israel, but he's reminding him of deliverance. We just said, what is the main thing? Egypt. He normally out of Egypt, mm -hmm. okay? Normally out of Egypt, he reminds them consistently what he did for them to remove them from slavery out of Egypt. Egypt, in a sense, is a form, is a, is a form of a slavery, just like sin. You know, we get delivered out of sin. They got delivered out of Egypt. Um, who was their deliverer? Moses. Moses. How do you deliver them? By the power of God. By the power of God. How else did he deliver them? What was the actual uh, consummation of his deliverance, Venus? If you had to say, what was what was the consummation of his deliverance, uh, delivering Egypt? What what event, like sealed it and ended it and was done? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I mean, I, I would say that when he came down with commandments. Okay. Yeah. I I'm, think that that's what it is. Okay. That, that they were basically lawless mm -hmm. even when they got from from Egypt. Right. So, when they crossed over. So to me, they couldn't be completely redeemed or delivered until they had 
a uh, the law. Okay, all right. But again, the Bible says the law could never save. Correct. Yeah, the law. It can only punish. It can only punish. It showed them what they could not do. Does anybody else have a different opinion about their deliverance when they get delivered? When Pharaoh said, get out. <laughs> okay. That's all right. That might be. All right. When Pharaoh said, get 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 going. I what? Think Go ahead. The Passover. Like, the, pa the Passover. Pharaoh. The Passover supper. The dinner. The event. The event. No, the event. Like, when they. When he, when death came and killed all the firstborn, mm -hmm. they didn't. I felt like that was kind of like the thing that. Mm -hmm. Well, let, well, they let still me. Still weren't delivered then. Okay. They but he didn't tell them to leave yet. Well, that's true. Um, I was thinking that just kind of when he put because remember that that's what that was one of the um, signs and wonders that Moses had to do for Pharaoh to see his you know his stubbornness. Right. Which is why I think that's when he, and then he let him go, like, gone. Mm -hmm. Like, go, like, this, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. It's oh. kind of like a... But he still chased him, so he really wasn't... Well, 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 <laughs> so, 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 hold on. Venus says something that's key that, that, that I think that will help us in this deliverance thing. Okay. The darkness was still after him, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did the darkness stop pursuing him? At the Red Sea. So, in other words, the Red Sea was the dividing line. Right. Mm -hmm. When, when... The, it, when the they, when the Red Sea fell on Pharaoh and his soldiers, or fell on his soldiers, that eliminated the threat. Right. Mm -hmm. They were delivered when they passed through the Red right. Sea, and then the threat was eliminated. Mm -hmm. Because there was no threat of that slavery being again, unless they voluntarily went back, which we know by what we read uh, in the Old Testament, what we've got up to is... Uh, they were told never to go back to Egypt, right, B? Right. And not to get anything from Egypt. Right. And not to get anything from Egypt. And in turn, they became their own darkness. Yeah. Yep. And they was complaining while they were up anyway. So but, you... Yeah. <laughs> what I'm saying is they were facing an actual enemy. Yeah. And I believe they became their own darkness. Yeah. Because they were complaining about the darkness. Yeah. Because they were complaining about the darkness. Yeah. And I believe they became their own enemy. Yeah. So what ends up happening is, even though we may get delivered, free will allows us to go back. Mm -hmm. Free will will allow you to go back. Right, right where this point, and y'all should know this, right where the point God delivered you from you will end up craving some time to go back because just like Nancy said, once they got out into the wilderness of where they didn't know, even God got them from slavery, yeah. they began to remember like, well, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> you know, we got to eat leeks and cucumbers and, and all that stuff. So it wasn't so bad. You got us out in the wilderness to perish. No water, no food, no nothing. Right. Didn't they desire meat though? And that's why if someone wanted to go back, no, yeah. he get, well, they desired meat, yeah, and he gave meat falling out their ears. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and what God is trying to, what I was trying to really show them was that you can trust what he says. You can trust his deliverance. His deliverance is complete. Okay? Mm -hmm. His deliverance is complete. And that's what we have to take into account uh, on the church age that what we have in Christ Jesus, the shadow of it was that delivered out of that darkness in crossed over. And the and the and the washing was by the blood, the you know crossing over on dry land, the washing, the the separate, the, the payment was, was with their blood, and now they're delivered. But the problem is, even delivered people have memories to want to go back. That's why in the Gospels he said, if you put your hand to this plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. So a lot of times with saints, we spend a lot of time dealing with trying to them to look forward and not look back. And it's hard because they've been redeemed, they've been delivered, but there's sometimes there's an attraction to the past uh, that is, is hard to break, but it can be broken over time if they continue to learn how to appreciate what was done for them. Law won't make me do it. Love will. His love for me will keep me from looking back because I'm always looking forward more to more of his love. Just shed abroad in my heart. He said he sheds his love onto us lavishly, this forgiveness onto us lavishly, you know. So it's not a lack of, and it says it's by his grace, his unmerited grace, his, his, his riches in grace that he continues to shed his love into our hearts to which we react and live, okay, and have our being. We have this in Christ Jesus, okay. Outside of Christ, you didn't have this, all right. Go, go ahead. What did I say? Oh, okay. What psalm did I have her read? Okay, it's read Psalm, Steve, read Psalm 120 and 7. I 
think it's 120. 130 and 7. 130 and 7. I'm sorry. Thank you, V. 130 is verse 7. Mm-hmm. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him in a, is abundant redemption. So it's an abundant redemption. So redemption is not a one time and done. Redemption is the ongoing uh, God reconciling, because he said in, in, in 2 Corinthians, and we read in Galatians, in, in Galatians, he's reconciling. He's continuing to reconcile. That's an ongoing thing. Okay? So redemption is, all, is part of ongoing. It never stops. The power of your redemption never stops. That blood is, is the payment, but the redemption never stops. Because the fact that you're being conformed to his image, and that's a process over time, which is called the sanctification process, your redemption is what is, is, is the evidence of who you are in Christ Jesus. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. You know, the Bible says, uh, what's it? Let the redeemed in the Lord, what? Say so. You know, we are the redeemed of the Lord. We're the forgiven of the Lord. We've been atoned for. We've been redeemed. And because all of this, uh, we have right relationship with God, okay? We have right relationship with God. With all of this, if you had to pick one word about everything that has happened to us because of what Christ has done, what would it be other than salvation? What would, what would you say? Righteousness. Righteousness. Nancy? I think word. <laughs> okay, move on. Steve? Redeemed. Redeemed. Other than redeemed? Yeah. I'm looking for a new word. Other than the word that's up there. Can you use redeemed or salvation? Nope. Um, that's I want you to I want you to think about it. Come back. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> Venus, what you got? No no restore, no redeem, no atonement. None of that that's up there. What what if you had to pick another word? If there if you can think of another word, you might can't. I don't have I mean the only word I have is freedom. Okay. Freedom. Holiness. Holiness, okay. Freedom, maybe. Freedom, okay. Freedom not up there. Go ahead. Which is part of the redemption. We're free. Go ahead. Another R word. Another R word. Restore. 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 <laughs> right. We have been restored. And my next question is restored to what? What have been restored to? To right relationship. Right relationship. In comparison to what kind of relationship? Wrong relationship. Or no relationship. Or no relationship. <laughs> but doesn't our, is, is the relationship that we have pre-adamic? Or after that, death, the restoration, the pre-fall, after-fall. Let me put the pre-fall. The pre-fall relation, where where you have direct access to God, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we've been restored, redeemed, and we also one of our favorite churches, refuge and restoration. We we take refuge in Christ. Yeah. Christ is our ark of covenant. Christ is our ark of safety. Christ is the example of that. Like I said, all those things that we see in the Old Testament. Or metaphors, or or examples, or shadows of the reality of Christ. We have been redeemed, and then we're safe inside of Christ Jesus. There's nothing that can get to you and remove you from Christ and condemn you. Okay. Now, again, like Venus say, there are natural consequences to your actions that that, that the law that God has given the law in the land that you need to follow, but. If you are truly, if you count on Jesus as your Savior, your trust in Jesus, then you are saved. All right? David understood salvation in a way that most people during his time didn't. He understood what Abraham understood. Abraham, what did it say about Abraham and, and his relationship to God? What did it say? Does anybody know? Abraham trusted God and what? It, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, a, a cow to him for righteousness. So, even though we're not, uh, Paul said all of Israel is not Israel, and he said the Israel that we're talking about is the Israel of what? You said it. We have two children of Israel. You got you got Hagar and you got who? Uh, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac. Okay. What does Ishmael represent? What does the Bible say about Ishmael? He represents the heir of the nation. Okay, but what about Ishmael compared to Isaac? Isaac is the child of the, the promise. Of the promise. Yeah. Ishmael is the child of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
So, so those who trust God are children of the what? Promise. Of the children of the promise. So a child of the flesh would be somebody who would try to work their way into heaven. Mm -hmm. Their good works or their attendance to church or uh, anything that you could do. You present for God and say, this justifies me and I have a right to the inheritance. I have a right to the righteousness. I have a right to not be condemned because look at all the great works I've done. Okay. But we know that the Bible tells us that the works of man are not worthy and not holy. They're filthy before God, you know. So I asked this question earlier today. I said, you got two people serving pancakes down at the homeless shelter. One saved, one not saved. We looking at them. How do we know who saved and not saved just by the act of that nice thing that they're doing? Both of them doing nice. Can we really judge them being saved by their actions? No. They're doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing. There's no way for us to judge them unless we start speaking to them and they kind of tell why they're doing. And I don't want to use extreme of the person down there with some accolades. The person just be down there because they're a good person. Some people are relatively good. Mm -hmm. And, and and they appear, and I say appear, that they don't have any issues with uh, the darkness that we are delivered from. They just relatively good people, okay? And then you have other people who understand what God has done for them, and they just want to return and give give back because of what God does. So the, so the issue down there with these two people is a heart issue that you won't really know unless they said something. Okay, unless they, they demonstrate something. So that's what I mean. We there we know no man after the flesh. You know, we have to listen, we have to watch, we have to pay attention because we are fruit 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 uh judgers, but we don't condemn. And sometimes our vocabulary is such that it sounds like we condemn people. Yeah. When really they are condemned already by what? What does the Bible say about them why they condemned already? They because they don't believe what believe in the God that wants to redeem them believe in the God that wants to restore them believe in the God that loves them believe in the God that if you don't the wrath of God is, is on you already you don't have to you don't have to wait for the judgment you you're going to get it okay but we want to take people out of it we learn that Paul says he spends all he does is warn people and try to persuade them that that this 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 God this Christ is the savior for the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike. You know, in Christ Jesus, there's no Greek, no Jew, no bond, no free, okay? That's all in Christ Jesus in this thing called redemption, okay? And we had a forgiveness of sins. We see that, all right? So if I'm redeemed, question, if I'm redeemed, should I take my redemption for granted? And if I, or can I take my redemption for granted? Is it possible? I mean, we have free will. Mm -hmm. So you could. But hold up, don't mean you take something for granted, that means you could lose it. Hmm, I like it. <laughs> Y'all better answer, Venus. What's your question? In order What's... to take something for granted, that means that you have a possibility of losing it. Because when you take something for granted, you just assume it's always going to be that. Mm -hmm. And so that means that you, since it's always going to be that, you can do what you want and there's no time. So, but when they say, I'm mean, you taking that for granted, like it's going to go away. This going to go away. Salvation doesn't go away. Right. So you take it for granted. And what's, what's the consequences for taking it for granted? Well, I mean, I guess it would just end up being like you wasting your time because although we're talking about things in eternity, our time on earth is still, is temporal. So, I mean, you could squander the gift that is this, but without fruit or, you know, I get you like take advantage of it, but eventually your time is going to be up and you have just wasted it all. So let me let me let me let me let me frame it in a different way. Mm -hmm. We can't lose our salvation, but we can lose our what? Rewards. Okay, other than our rewards, our what? Really, let's fall out of grace or like uh, not fall out of grace. Well, what well, I know what you're looking for. Go ahead, find it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, find 
Let me go ahead. Yeah. I want you to uh, parse it out. Like, you know, like your, like your good, like a good standing. Like, I can't even think of the word I'm looking for, but it's like, you took it for granted because it's like, I think that, that I could just start doing whatever I want to and it's like, shall we continue to sin? No. Right. You're not supposed God to. Forbid. So yeah. God forbid. Yeah. Like, God forbid. Like, you should not be doing that like that. Like, you mm -hmm. gotta, you taking it for granted like, oh, you know, don't worry about it because God gonna forgive me anyway. Like, you just mm -hmm. using that to. to you taking advantage of grace in the wrong way. Yes. Mm hmm When you should be appreciating it. Mm hmm and that way, you know, because of the grace that you have mm -hmm. in your redemption and the love that God has for you, that you are going to appreciate it. And mm -hmm. therefore, your your actions will follow the appreciation and the love that you also have for Christ because he loves you. So are you saying, Nancy, that the more I value Christ and appreciation what he did for me by redeeming me, that I uh, uh, have a better relationship with him? Yes. So if I do sin, the relationship by what we say the Holy Spirit said, because you can what the Holy Spirit? Grieve. Grieve the Holy Spirit. So when we sin willfully, unwillingly, um, we, we be convicted. By be, the faster you get convicted, will determine, will actually be proof, will be fruit of your relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things that should that might have took a week, uh, a couple of years back. Get, get, you get convicted of in a couple of hours mm -hmm. because you you're being more conformed to the Christ image mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. So so no, you don't lose your salvation, but your relationship uh, becomes strained, not completely cut off, but a okay. uh, strained. And what did he give us as a means to return back into right relationship? Repentance. repentance. And what does repentance mean? A whole bunch of R words. What does repentance mean? To turn, to turn away from. Mm-hmm. So in the Old Testament, they didn't use the word repentance, but they sure used the word turn, didn't they? Turn away. From you. Turn, away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> turn away. Turn away. Turn away. Yeah. Now, if I go back to doing what I did before, Venus, have I actually repented? No. Why? I mean, come on now. I can, you know, I stayed cool for a while, you know, for a couple of weeks. But then, you know, that temptation got to me and I went back. Well, it says Matthew 7, okay. 21. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on this day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you do, evil doers. Mm -hmm. So you can, to, to, to ask for me, and I used to say this all the time, and I know it makes more sense. To me, you can repent all you want to, but see, you have complete repentance, you're not repenting. Okay. So I used to say that I'm not going to ask God for forgiveness for fornicating. Mm -hmm. Because I was going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And to me, asking for forgiveness for something I was going to do again made no sense to my logical mind. Okay. Not saying mm -hmm. that that's what you should say and do it. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, is that when when I start when I when the minute that I stopped fornicating, it was done, and I didn't turn back. Okay. And the turn back is the true repentance. It's not the three sixty. It's a one eighty. Okay, and and she's exactly right. The repentance is truly that you're done, mm -hmm. that you're done. Now, we found out just in life that repentance is a, such a spiritual thing, and it really really depends on point like what you said, your appreciation. When I repent in appreciation, that's where the godly sorrow comes in because I understand I violated the love of God for me okay, and his law. So the more I appreciate what's done at the cross, that repentance, I'm going to use this word for lack of a better word, it'll stick more through love versus the law. Mm -hmm. if, you don't have a, if you don't have any guilt behind it mm -hmm. or if you don't feel sorrow from doing it, because it doesn't feel the same when you truly repent it, okay. if you backslide. So yeah. say, for instance, in the, in the instance of you fornicating and you like, God, I'm not going to do this no more. I really, and then you, that, then you actually backslide. It hurts you more because you know you're hurting Christ. Okay. Before you didn't care because mm -hmm. it was just, mm -hmm. it was something to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we one more scripture. We done, we, we done for the day. Uh, First Peter. Frida. 
118 and 119. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So now what we see is even the word ransom is like you've been redeemed. Mm -hmm. Ransom, you've been bought back, mm -hmm. okay, from, uh, uh, and it wasn't with perishable things. It was with the blood of Christ. So that also lets you know that the blood of Christ is eternal. It's still working the same, working what it did at Calvary, it's doing now. So we have redemption, we have restoration, we have the atonement, we have imputed righteousness, we have the love of God, we have the ark of safety being put in Christ Jesus, and all this is inside of Christ Jesus. And as we understand about forgiveness, think about the lady with the alabaster box. She did. She she was so happy to receive forgiveness because her. Her lifestyle was a life of sin, so she loved much because she's forgiven much, and so do we as we end this thing about forgiveness and unforgiveness. Our key to walking with Christ is walking in a, a understanding of how much we've been forgiven, how much we have in Christ Jesus, and how much of that are we willing to share with other people to get them to see the beauty of coming to Christ versus the alternative, which is the wrath of God. We have to paint a clear alternative. Don't run to what I, the good until you explicitly make the bad so bad that they ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Okay? Because to get them with the goods and say, well, I want to be saved to get all that good stuff. They normally are interpreting that is they're looking at what you have materially. Okay? But what we're talking about is a walk of the spirit and a walk of love. And you can only do that if you fully understand how much you've been forgiven. And, we, and I'm telling you, my own experience, the more I did, dive into the depths of Christ and quit skimming the surface, what I begin to do is nothing really bothers me because I understand the state of human beings. Uh, the ones who not saved, I know why they're acting the way they're not acting. They say, they're unsaved. And even the saved saints who do something, you know what? I understand why they're acting the way they're acting. They haven't matured yet. Because in the old, in the New Testament, it always talks about growing up in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, yeah. being ed of the body, being edified in, in Ephesians. What the fivefold ministry for is to edify, grow up the body into the fullness of man. So that part is the sanctification process. And so when I see a saint fall, and I have to practice Galatians six and one, what ends up happening is I understand it's not to keep them down but to try to bring them along even further so they won't fall back. Maturity will keep you from falling back. Immaturity will keep you where you are. That's why a lot of people, you have altar call is, is kind of interesting to me because any, all of us have been in church for a minute and we've seen the same people run to the altar all the time because what they're doing, they're thinking the act of coming forward, running up to the wooden a representative of God or whatever at the time actually does something. But really all they need to do is study the word of God, learn the word of God, and that will mature them and help deliver them. Somebody said something to me that was so profound. They said while they were chasing events and, and situations where people laid hands on them, they said they didn't realize that the deliverance for the saint is in the word of God. And I thought that was real powerful because they were like, I used to run to the altar every week, every week, every week, every week. And she said that what she was taught, that's what you do. But she was never taught that the power was in the word of God and your understanding what you have in Christ Jesus. If you grow up in the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you don't need to run to the altar because guess what? Coming to his word is your altar. That is your altar. No physical act God is pleased with in that way. You know, even in our worship, that's what that's the beauty about being in the body of Christ. We all we all have different worship expressions, but the expression has to come from the heart that understands that they've been saved by Christ. And that's it. And it's, and it's simple, but it's, it's complex in, in our thought processes because our minds go all over the place when it comes to church and religion. It just goes all over the place when really we need to just focus on being the body of Christ and the relationship with our head, which is Jesus Christ. What he did for us, what he attained by dying for us. And now that we're redeemed, we can just go forward in faith.
You know, I know a lot of people too, and I'm done with this. A lot of people, I hear this all the time, Pastor, um, I want to know that I'm doing right. Okay. Read the word. It'll tell you. <laughs> and then the second thing is, there, it's like before you became a Christian, you weren't scared of anything. Now that you're going to Christian, you're scared of everything. And I tell them, I don't know. Do it in faith. God say, if it's, it's impossible, please me unless you do whatever you're doing in faith. Do it in faith. And if it's wrong, don't worry about the condemnation. He'll correct you. And if it's real wrong, you're going to get chastisement. And nine times out of ten, I'm just willing to bet, you know when you're doing wrong and deserve the chastisement of God. You know, just like a parent. When you was a kid, you knew when you was doing wrong. You just hope you never got caught. You know, but you're going to get caught with God because you're going to get convicted quick. And that may be, God say, if you confess your sins to me, you don't have to get judged and punished. That's all he wants you to do is confess and turn. But if you're not willing to confess and turn, if you just want to confess and keep burning in that direction, then he says, okay, I got to whoop you. I got to whoop you. I got to whoop you a little bit, little bit. And there is a sin unto death. And a sin unto death doesn't mean they're not saved. God may decide, you know what? You my child and everybody looking at you. I got to bring you home because you making a fool, a, a mockery of me. So I got to bring you home, you know? So, so we don't fear death. We love the fact that God loves us and we've been redeemed. Let's pray. Oh, Grace Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. Continue to let us walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, we are the redeemed and let us say so. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for tuning in to the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast on the WITRN network. Come join us every Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time for Sunday worship. Bible study is held on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We are located at 3006 North Lindbergh Boulevard Suite 711, St. Louis, Missouri, 63074. All are welcome and we look forward to seeing you soon.